Hello, everyone. Um, this is a slightly different format than usual, but thanks for having me today. Uh, it's the first time anyone's ever asked me to talk about my entrepreneurship story. So disclaimer, um, 15 minutes won't get you the full movie, but it'll get you like some sort of long trailer version with a lot of spoilers in it. So as we go through, I'm going to do my best to underscore the why, as in why did I start each of these businesses. So to start, I'm from Michigan. I lived in a bunch of different places, but I was born in the capital okay. city there. And when it came down to it, I was a neighborhood kid. You know, I could walk to my elementary school. My friends lived a few houses away. And um, at the time, we were super into video games around elementary school times. And our parents didn't love it, but it was also better than us getting in trouble out in the streets. So when I say super into it, I should provide some context. So, I mean, if you're older, if you're older like me, you probably remember as an old uh, movie with Fred Savage in it. Um, it was all real. Like we were in the Nintendo World Championships when I was like nine years old. So this is way before all the e-gaming stuff. And around fourth grade, my friend Lee and I had developed a relationship with some of the people at Nintendo Power, which was the big gaming magazine at the time. Together, we had already decided with a couple of friends to start buying different games so we could amass like a really big collection. And then we'd be like trading with people and whatnot. But we started calling ourselves Nintendo Tips and Tricks of the Trade. And so this was my first business. And why did I start it? Well, I wanted more video games. And that was the only way I was going to be able to have the money or access to the thing that I wanted, which was more games. So for a small fee, kids could rent a game and get handwritten video game tips. And then if they needed help, we'd actually do phone calls for a little extra money. This wasn't a wildly huge business, but it provided, it did eventually pivot into a game exchange and I got what I wanted out of it, which was access to any game. I realized then that I did love video games, but I really loved creating brands and businesses. So moving forward, um, this my little money-making scheme. My mom was always priming me to go to college, like always. Like since I was six, she had me saying I was gonna be an engineer. So she would have me sign up for these little summer camp situations like in 93, when she had me in an engineering camp at uh, Michigan State University. It just so happens that MSU was a campus uh, that got the internet kind of early. Uh, it was like them in, in, in Washington, Seattle, I believe. And my dad exposed me to um, a home computer early on, but this is where I was really learning what the future of everything would be about. Not too long after that program, I got shipped off to another thing, which was like some random summer camp. And I can't remember exactly what it was because I'd actually bought my first book on HTML, which is like the only book I had bought as a child. Um, that entire trip, I was just literally learning HTML because I wanted to figure out how could I build a website to sell to people anywhere. So after about a year of you know, messing around with the website stuff, I kicked off a little design business where I was building websites for my dad's friends' companies. So my parents were both social workers, so they were pretty connected to their respective communities. And that allow for me to have access, access to some early customers. And my dad was also very into audio, and so was my stepmom. And so stereo systems and music was also a passion of mine. And that was a much more expensive hobby than gaming. And so the more exposure I got to better sound, the, the more expensive the sound equipment got. And it just so happens that my other best friend, Martin, had been bitten by a speaker bug as well. So we joined forces to build what would eventually become MJH Sound or Martin Jacob James Howie Sound. So remember, we're on the internet now and people are actually like posting up speaker designs and design software. And at the time, I think we collectively had about $50 to start what was gonna be our business, which wasn't enough to buy the parts we needed to do our first project. But, you know, we searched through the newspapers. There was like no Craigslist or anything. And we were like looking for high-end audio and Sears have to be going through a bankruptcy. So we had our mom drop us off over there and we picked up these two MTX speakers. They were normally 120 bucks each. But they were $20 each on closeout, which was right in our budget. So we got to building prototypes. And once we had sold, built and sold our first speaker, we began spreading the word. And this was just like the beginning. So now MGA Sound is a, is a real thing. And we were just going into high school at the time. So a new charter school had popped up in the city and they, their claim to fame was every kid was gonna have a computer and access the T1 internet. Now T1 internet was the end all be all. Now today it would be meaningless. It would almost constitute no connectivity to the internet at 1.5 megabits per second. But back then it was everything. 
And so we both made the mission cut to get into the school and we were super hyped because it was gonna allow us to build our website all day, every day. As soon as we got there, we found a couple early customers, but one conversation really changed our lives. Never forget the kid's name. We're in homeroom, he's beatboxing, doing whatever. And he stops, because we're, we're always selling people stuff. He stops us and says, shut the hell up. So, oh, it's it's, it's a Fernando Hernandez, key to have his name. He's like, shut the hell up about your home speakers. We low riding, where's the car audio at? And like light bulb moment, because I don't have a car. I don't, I don't have an older brother who has a car or something like that. That weekend we got feverishly after it, like just scouring the internet, looking for local supplies. And our whole, our whole like focus shifted from home audio to everything. The website became car audio, all of that. This was my first real market feedback point. And it affected me, has affected me to this day in terms of how I run any business. I'm always wanting to intimately know my customer. And that was the first point where I realized the importance of that. Now, while this was a new high school with the fastest internet, it was also the school with the baddest ass kids because it had not only accepted us, but all the kids who got kicked out of every other public school. So for better or for worse, it might not be great for education, but it did facilitate a customer base of kids who had the money to buy what we were selling. So by junior year, we were selling locally and around the world through the website and treating my mom's garage like a product warehouse. UPS was in and out of there. And I had my own phone line too, because I couldn't have my mom's phone calls interrupting my you know, phone line connect to internet. So let's go back to the why again. So we started MJ Sound to make more money, but now we're actually making money. And I'm like, oh, I really want to be able to buy my mom some stuff. So the, the why, the reason why I'm building the business continues to evolve. And MGH is ramping nicely, but I was looking to wait to make more money still. And another shiny object caught my eye, which was the burnable CD. So while I had a number of side hustles next to MJ Sound, none of them is more memorable than this one. Um, I had spent time in New York with my dad um, and I was exposed to, you know, more underground hip hop there through radio shows like Stretch and Bobbito and other college radio stations. And around this time, record labels were kind of moving some products digitally and it didn't have much protection. So big albums were leaking regularly. And so me and my brother kind of created this bootleg CD ring. I had relationships with, with kids at multiple high schools because I attended multiple high schools. And so I'd survey the students, you know, kind of getting that customer feedback to figure out what were the popular albums. And I would deliver them weeks before they came in the stores. To give you an idea of the scale, through a Detroit connection once, we had early access to Eminem, Marshall Mathers. This was like 99. And um, in a couple of weeks, we sold about 3,000 copies. And my average wholesale cost to my distributors was $4. So this is a lot of money, right? This business wasn't fully legal, so it can never become my career. But in concert with MGH, it was like sometimes I'd sell someone some speakers and give them a couple free albums. It was all these bonuses. It was my first experience of multiple revenue streams. And it seemed great at the time, but as I grew, I think I would find that not having focus on the core business would limit my ability to grow it to its maximum potential. Now, going back to the current story, senior year, um, you know, we are making a better living than some of our teachers and really had a vision for where I want to take this business. But my mom had no interest in that because she was like, you're going to college. And just like anything, it was like, we got to get this kid to where he's going. And so she had done this lay work on my admissions to the University of Michigan for engineering. And um, I got admitted. And it was a for a probation program because naturally my grades were pretty good, but um, not exactly great because I was doing all this business stuff. But, you know, I had this, this opportunity for my freshman year to get to that admission through the probation program. So I got in and once I got to school, I realized the pool of customers was different. These kids did come from like very well-to-do backgrounds, but college students in general are broke and none of them are spending money on their cars. So not to mention when in electrical engineering properly started after that summer ended, it was properly kicking my ass. I had to maintain focus in order to make it through that program. So I was learning a lot about audio in those classes, which was cool, but I wasn't really focused on the business. And what I was really getting out of it in the end was how to evaluate a problem and craft a solution which I was really kind of really getting into that side of it. Now, during college, and I wasn't focused on the business, Google had begun taking over search and I was, you know, the algorithms unindexed me from, from all around the internet. And, you know, I didn't own the dot-com because those were expensive back in the early nineties. And I was really literally piggybacking off a server I had set up for someone 10 years before when I had that web design hustle that I mentioned. So competitors began to swoop in. And that was because unbeknownst to me on the other side of the country, 
the dot-com boom was taking place. It was, in, it was in full swing. And the internet was no longer mom and pop pioneers like myself. So I was spending less time online selling stuff and more time with my car crew in Ann Arbor. So I've always been a car person. And we had some pretty serious rides. A couple of them were Mazdas. Around this time, I was trying to figure out what was the next move. So I went for a moonshot. I pitched Mazda on building a custom vehicle by emailing them through their website. And lo and behold, they came back to me with a formal like request for a proposal. So I did all this work, got this crazy proposal together and fast forward, a semi was dropping off a brand new Mazda 3 to my apartment and it was mine to redesign and present to the world and the car wasn't even out yet. Um, MJ Sound, we were, I was becoming a custom coach builder, you know, to help the biggest brands in the world launch their new vehicles. We needed a new way, like a new brand to present who we were. And so that's where we enter shift marketing solutions. Now let's step to the why again. Now it's like, we already made money doing the car stuff. I was kind of on my way out of school. I need to create a new career. The why was I wanted this to be my job. I always wanted to be a car designer. This gave me access to the cars that I wanted. And I got to make money and, and modify in the way I like to. So I'm still kind of on this money making scheme strategy, but a little bit more structure to it. Now, during my senior year at college, you know, we had cars coming from Mazda, Lincoln, and Honda, and client, more clients were coming on board for us to deliver um, vehicles to this thing called the SEMA show in Vegas. With all this cross-country traveling, I was like, I need to move to LA. And so I did apply to a couple of jobs coming out of school to see what happened, and mainly because my dream job was open at Mitsubishi Motors, which was, I want to be a product planner or designer. And lo and behold, I got the job just before I moved to LA, so I was on my way. And to give you context for that, both of these guys who hired me had went to Michigan and they had a high amount of respect for what I had done with MGH and Shift Marketing Solutions. So my EECS degree at Michigan, backed by my self-made experiences, had landed me in a job fresh out of college that would normally not be accessible to anybody at that age. And this just illuminated the fact that experience is key. And it doesn't matter whether or not you succeed or fail, it is the experiences that allow you to build your way to where you want to go. And that also is what I've carried with me till today. And so while I had my sheer focus on shift marketing for a couple of years, I was quickly back in the multiple hustle game. You know, I have a full-time job at Mitsubishi. I'm still delivering cars to movies like Fast and the Furious and building SEMA show cars. And I just couldn't help myself, but try to have my cake and eat it too. But naturally, once again, the business starts to slow down. So this is not completely my fault because the business of cars in general was slowing down around that time because of the looming recession. But all in all, we had to move on to something new. So one day we're driving down PCH, going through Newport Beach, just like we did on a normal Sunday, my friend Joe and I, and we popped into a BT clothing shop and I saw a shirt and it instantly said, I'm a car enthusiast. Like not literally, but there was no cars on the shirt or anything, but just design made it very clear. And that afternoon we thought to ourselves, why isn't there a whole clothing line for people like us, like car enthusiasts. That day, first motoring, first motoring apparel was born. And I mean, I'm still wearing the clothes today right now. And I won't dive too deep into the escapade, but we were in LA. We went to meet with executives of different clothing lines to learn production. We learned Adobe Illustrator to do the vector art. We had to come up with prototypes and we went to pick our own cotton rolls in the fashion district to finding the dye house to dye the clothes. This was a real thing. And while we were developing the clothing line and we were hanging out at Joe's house one day, he had his roommate from college come through and he had just gotten this program called Y Combinator. This was you know, now a prestigious program, but back then was just an experiment in its infancy. And he was starting Dropbox. So Drew was my first introduction to angel and venture funding and I was hooked. The fact that someone who would give you money to build a business that wasn't even really making money yet was mind blowing to me. At the same time, my roommate in LA was going to USC uh, Marshall School. And I was like, let me go get classes with them so I can do this business thing better. So through the business school connections we cultivated, we actually got funding for first from a classmate who was starting an incubator for physical goods. And during that time, it was 2008, other things were going on. I was at home streaming video from my computer to my TV. And that experience was arduous and I couldn't figure out how to watch TV in the same way without cable. And I came up with this idea of building an online channel guide and so the clothing stuff was cool, but I, all this car stuff, I knew it wasn't gonna take me where I wanted to go. And I had this startup bug that Drew had planted and thus began my foray, foray into UB video. 
And this is where vision got bigger. So the why again, uh, I was doing it for money, but also because I wanted to build this big product that everybody in the world would use. So I'm starting to expand. And from here, I'll fast forward a little bit, but UB Video is my experience, my, my hard knock experience of a startup. So being the bad CEO, not knowing how to motivate people and, and cultivate a team, having the wrong co-founder, hiring the wrong engineers, having the wrong investors. But ultimately, the only thing I really had was the product because that's what I was in full control of. And that got me into um, a program called NUMI, which moved me to the Bay Area where I got more exposure to Silicon Valley. And now it was clear that this is where one needed to be if they wanted to pursue what I was doing. Knew me also changed my why because I wasn't making a lot of money. I was just making way more, way more money when I was a kid. I was still doing the startup thing and there was no revenue happening. But I saw people around me that looked like me building tech companies and saw their challenges as well. I knew that one day I wanted to have the money to invest in other people like me who were trying to build these companies. So I ended up getting an IP acquisition offer for Yubi and that kept me staying in the Bay. And so I started my next company, Group Flix which was to be an a la carte TV service. And this time I knew the game because I'd already been introduced to Ben Horowitz and Ms. K. Poor and Michael Seibel and I already knew Drew. I had all this help and understanding. And so I had hired all my Stanford and MIT friends to be on the team. We built the product, had a thousand customers sign up in eight days. And the only friction we had from investors was, do you have the contracts in order to do this, do the, stream the content? And I went and got the contracts over six months. I came back and there was no investors to be found. And that's when I realized I wasn't able to walk the same path as other, other founders that I knew. My white male counterparts, that was not to be my path. And I realized when I look back at everything I had done, I was creating my own path, a, my, a path that other people hopefully will be able to follow one day. And so I did two things at this moment, 2015. I pivoted Group Flix to become pilot because I knew in the market research business, I could get the revenue without venture capital. And in being the first research platform built for creative content, today, Wall Street Journal calls my company the data engine at the heart of Hollywood's content factories. And secondly, and more importantly, um, I started Transparent Collective. This was me kind of recreating Numi, but for the rest of the world with more to it, because I wanted to help underrepresented founders get the resources they need to succeed. And here's where my why evolved to where it is today. I didn't want to wait to help people for me, I wanted to wait for me to exit the company or make so much money before I could help people. I had enough knowledge and resources to help people now. And so that's where Transparent Collective took focal point. And today we've helped 52 companies raise over $40 million in early stage funding. They've all raised more money than I have. And so when you break this all down, entrepreneurship can be a lifelong journey. Um, in the most traditional sense, an entrepreneur is a hustler who bets on themselves 100 out of 100 times. But in the modern sense, it's much more than that. And I've re I didn't realize that until I was much later in the game. It's the ability to convey your vision and give others ownership of it. You'd be surprised. Most people are heavily motivated by, or, or aren't heavily motivated by money. I mean, a paycheck gives them life comforts, but while wealth is not in their realm, only a select few thrive off that pursuit. So you can't actually fuel someone with the vision of making that money. You have to find something else and the ability to help people achieve their maximum potential. Because if you're a superhero, you want to at least be rolling around with a bunch of Robins or people who are jockeying to be on the Justice League table. So you, you got to help people grow. And knowing yourself and where you fit in the grand scheme of things is how you build the best team to grow around you. And the reality is not everyone was born to be an entrepreneur. People can learn to do a good business, but mathematically, there are a select few who will see themselves to some near unicorn success exit with a tech company. So there's no shame in joining a company early on because it's a great way to make money, learn a lot, enjoy your job and build a great career path. But if you set off to do what I do, you have to ask yourself the most important question. Why you and what are you doing it for? And it took me over 30 years to figure out that I do this for black culture. Thank you for your time and hopefully it's been enlightening.